Shalom, and welcome to this uh, special Talking Memory program commemorating the 78th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. My name is Medin Shachar, and I work at the Ghetto Fighters House as a guide and an educator. I want to welcome our global audience from all over the world, as you can see in the chat, including friends and colleagues from Holocaust museums, institutions, and centers, academics and students from universities, historians, and our many friends who attend the Talking Memory series. As always, a special welcome to the survivors and their families that are with us today. Thank our partners for today's program, Classrooms Without Borders. And now I would like to invite Egal Cohen, CEO of the Ghetto Fighters House, to say a few opening remarks. Egal? Hello, everyone. On the eve of Passover, exactly 78 years ago, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising began. It was, uh, it was one of the most remarkable and significant symbols of the struggles against, against the Nazi regime by Jews during World War II and the Holocaust. Today, as time has passed, we understand that the uprising had served as an inspiration for others to raise arms against the Nazi regime. It continues to inspire us to oppose any regime that uses its power to oppress anyone because of whom they are. The uprising inspired other acts, other acts of resistance throughout occupied Europe and served as a living example of the human spirit, its power and the heights to which it can reach. Over the past two weeks, the Ghetto Fighters House has touched upon the different expressions of commemoration and emotion. It seems to me that there is nothing more symbolic than to conclude, conclude with an event directly connected to the spirit of the Ghetto Fighters House and the vision of its founders. I want to thank you, Professor Javi Dreyfus, for your ongoing partnership with the Ghetto Fighters House. I also want to thank Classroom Without Borders for co-hosting this event, and Medin Shachar for heading the Talking Memory International online lecture series. Finally, I want to thank all of you, our dear friends, our dear friends for connecting to support this creative effort and world, worldwide partnership. We welcome your participation wholeheartedly. Thank you. Thank you, Igal. Today's program marks the last stage of the Warsaw Ghetto, including the uprising that started on April 19, 1943. Today's date, April 18th, is the 72nd anniversary of the foundation of the Ghetto Fighters Kibbutz and the groundbreaking ceremony of the museum that goes by the na same name and is dedicated to the poet Yitzhak Katzenelson. Katzenelson's lifelong work as a writer and educator was an inspiration to those founders of Kibbutz Lohamea Getaot and the Ghetto Fighters House that knew him personally and decided to dedicate the museum in his memory. The Yitzhak Katzenelson collection is available in the museum's archives. His words, like those of other writers and diarists in the Warsaw Ghetto, Chaim Kaplan and Abraham Levine, present not only a more nuanced understanding of, the, of their everyday experience, but reflect the experiences of many other Jews trapped in the Warsaw Ghetto. Between hope and despair, Katzenelson, Kaplan and Levine were committed to writing their personal stories and each made sure that their diaries survive while fully aware that they may not succeed in staying alive to bear witness after the war. Therefore, the sense of urgency to present the perspective and experience, both personal and Jewish, as well as the desire to make their words available to the outside world, reflect an act of resistance. And as historian Alexandra Garbarini claims, with the purpose of ensuring that the Jewish cataclysm shook the world to its core and would have an effect on the future. This is the goal of today's program. And we are honored to have Professor Javi Dreyfus, one of the world's leading experts on the Warsaw Ghetto with us to share her insights. But first, a short introduction. Javi Dreyfus is professor of Jewish history and head of the Institute for the History of Polish Jewry and Israel-Poland relations at Tel Aviv University, as well as director of the Center for Research on the Holocaust in Poland at the International Institute for Holocaust Research 
at Yad Vashem. Her research deals with various aspects of everyday life during the Holocaust, including the relationship between Jews and Poles, religious life in the light of the Holocaust, and Jewish existence in the face of extermination. Her latest book, The Warsaw Ghetto, The End, April 1942, July, June 1943, won the Shazar Prize for the study of Jewish history and will soon be published in English. Uh, Professor Dreyfus, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Medin. Thank you very much, Eagle and Ron and Itai and Adam and everybody who is involved in this very, uh, very impressive uh, talks of uh, memory. Uh, I'm honored to be here. And I just want to add my thang thanks to each and every one of those uh, who came to listen to this meeting about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. I saw many colleagues, which I won't mention their names because for sure I will forget somebody. Uh, but I will also want to add my thanks to those Holocaust survivors. And I know that there are some of you who are here with us. I will try to describe some of those difficult events that happened in the Warsaw Ghetto, which you remember and still carry with you. And actually your testimonies and your writings from the war period or later on are an inspiration for all of us, an important tool in our work. Um, one might ask, and here I'm jumping into this very difficult topic, as uh, Eagle and as Madin said, this is, we are today mentioning the 78th uh, anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. One can ask, why should anybody want to write another book about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising? I mean, so many books were written, so many things were published about this uh, important event, and I'll just uh, mention a few of them one second. I want to share my presentation, sorry for that. Okay, Medin already mentioned my book, but much more important is that this, of course, is not, not only not the first book, but not, not the only book on shelf. There are so many things written about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. We have academic writings, and here I'll just mention two of the most important books, one by Israel Gutman, the late Israel Gutman, and the other one by, by Barbara Engelking and Jacek Loacek, both give such a, gr a good uh, a description of the events that happened within the ghetto and during the uprising. We have so many document collections. Those are in English, German, Polish, Hebrew, Yiddish, Yiddish as well as so many me personal memories. So why should anybody want to write another book about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising? When I started looking at this topic, I asked myself mainly one question. There's so much writings about the daily life in Warsaw Ghetto, economical life, family ties, political organizations, education, and many other things. But somehow, when we come to the summer of 1942, when the Jews were deported to Treblinka, we stopped, we stopped talking about those people. We stopped talking about the Jewish community as a community, and we're concentrating on the uprising, on the revolt. And one of the most important things to remember is that then when the uprising started, almost 50,000 Jews still lived in the ghetto. That means that 98% of them were not part of this organization or that organization, but were actually just the Jews who were living in this ghetto. So when I started working, I thought I don't want to talk at all about those undergrounds. I want to concentrate on the daily life of those Jews who still lived before the uprising and during the uprising and to try to understand what were their life, what were their hopes, their distress, what did they think was about to happen, and did they have any practical part in the uprising? Now, one thing that I must mention here, that like any historian, one of my basic tools, of course, is sources. And when I was looking for sources, I saw that there are so many sources. I could talk endlessly about the Jewish sources. And actually the diary that you can see here is the only wartime diary we have from the uprising, written during the uprising, which is preserved in Ghetto Fighters House, as well as many other important documents. We have letters, we have later accounts, if there are the accounts of Spielberg or accounts given right after the Second World War. We have, of course, Polish uh, sources as well, 
although I was more concentrated on the Jewish perspective. And of course, we have German accounts as well. And those German accounts are very important, but I just want to mention one kind of source that for me uh, imposed many questions, and those are the photos. Now we have, of course, the photos of Jürgen Strupp, and we all know the famous picture, maybe the most well-known photo of the Holocaust of this child raising his hands. This photo, of course, was taken during the Warsaw ghetto uprising, and we can talk endlessly about those photos, as well as those photos of rabbis still having their traditional clothes in May 1943 during the uprising. But we have other visual documentation as pictures taken by the Germans themselves in Kochmana Bar, which was just a bar in Warsaw with anti-Jewish uh, drawing on the, on the uh, walls. We can talk about those very unique pictures, photos taken in the Umschlagplatz, the only photos we have from the Umschlagplatz taken during the uprising. But we can also talk about aerial photos that as I hope you will be, see, will be able to see later, were for me a very important source, of, or at least uh, it draw my intention for, to one of, I think, an important point. And above that, we have also Jewish testimonies, which were broken not by word, words, but by drawings. For example, the, those are drawings of Peretz Khurshati, who gave a very detailed testimony, but given by drawings. Here he, he describes his, uh, his wedding during the great deportation of the Warsaw Ghetto, when they are entering the rabbi's house, first the parents of his, uh, of his future wife, then both of them trying to evade the Jewish police and the Germans in the streets, as well as hiding places and other things. So we had many sources. I will also say that at least some of those sources the visual sources, as well as the other sources, pose for me very great uh, difficulty because, and maybe we can elaborate this later on, one of the problems that I had to face is that some of those testimonies were so difficult, visual or written, that I had to ask myself if really giving them or br bringing them to the reader as they are might have a counter effect and just make people leave the subject. And I'm saying this before we start because I will refer to very difficult uh, descriptions, but I think that 78 years after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, we need to talk not only about the undergrounds, but about the daily life, and those were tragic daily life of Jews during uh, those times. And just to make sure that we all understand what we're talking about, a very short introduction, and I will take, I don't know, like 10, 10 maybe 15 minutes, just to introduce the Warsaw Ghetto, which I'm sure is very much well to known to many of you. We know that before the war, about a third of the population of Warsaw were Jews. Uh, when the Germans occupied Poland, and of course we have September 1st, the outbreak of the war and the surrender of Warsaw, they found in Warsaw again about a third of its population as Jews, but they are not the same Jews. Many fled, many are, are refugees, and we know today that a third of the Jewish inhabitants of the ghettos were, of the Warsaw ghetto, were uh, refugees. But we also know that from the very beginning of its, its establishment of the ghetto, uh, dire uh, conditions uh, prevailed in the ghetto, and from those dark conditions, more than 80,000 Jews died. And this number is very important because those 80,000 Jews died from natural causes, as Jews during the war themselves said. But despite the dire conditions, there was some kind of a routine in the Warsaw Ghetto, which broke dramatically on the night between the 17th and the 18th of April, 1942. And here I want to explain that until that date, although there was terror in the streets, although there were uh, executions, although there were very difficult uh, conditions, the Germans did not, almost did not enter houses of the, in, into the, in the ghetto. On that night, they entered the ghetto and shot by least 50 Jews. One of them is Menachem Linder, who you can see here, his photo here, and those Jews were shot, but actually from that night on, the Germans entered the ghetto almost every night. This is when the private sphere, 
which was some kind of a safe sphere until then is starting to be shaken. But that's not the only reason for that. Because in those days, and we're talking on the beginning of the year 1942, rumors about what is happening in other places are penetrating the ghetto. Roja Kaplan is writing her husband. She's in a small ghetto. She's writing her husband. Now everything is shaken beneath me. At this moment, I spoke to someone who came from Chelmenu, who fled from Chelmenu. The same thing that happened to the Anne von Kalish is happening to them. This is not a lie. Now, we don't know what happened to the Anne von Kalish, but her husband Shmuel, who was in the ghetto, knew for sure. And she also says, I, I would want to flee, to flee and come to the Warsaw ghetto, but it's winter now and the kids might freeze on the way. But if I wait, I'm not sure if we will survive. Those rumors are penetrating the ghetto, but as Rav said, in March 1942, I first heard that somewhere in Poland, Jews were put in small rooms and killed by gas. I did not believe, and I did not know anyone who thought it was possible. We can later on talk about why people did not believe it, but some thought that Warsaw Ghetto is exceptional. It's very large. It's in the capital of a European city. There are hundreds of thousands of Jews living in the Warsaw Ghetto. How can somebody kill almost half a million people? This is unbelievable. Some of the Jews said we are working in shops, in those workshops, or in factories, and there are so many uh, refugees in the ghetto, if the Germans would want, wanted to kill them, they would have killed them somewhere else. So Warsaw ghetto is exceptional. The murders are ex exceptional. They are happening in the East, they are happening in the West. They are happening, but they will not happen to me. And this belief that this, it will not happen to me breaks dramatically on the great deportation between July 22nd, that is the eve of Tisha B'Av, and September 21st, that is the eve of Yom Kippur, when more, when, when more than 3, uh, 300,000 men, women, and children are sent to Treblinka and killed there. This is when the ghetto, as we knew until then, stops to exist. And this is when all the uh, different classes in the ghetto, all the political circles, educational systems, anything we were talking about before, everything was devastated in a way that we have to refer to it. And I'll give you just one example. What you can see here are the numbers of the Jews in the ghetto prior to the Great Deportation and after that. You can see that prior to the Great Deportation, there were about 50,000 children under the age of nine. After the Great Deportation, there are 253. There were more than 70,000 youngsters between the age of 10 and 19. After the Great Deportation, there are about 2,500. There are no old people in the ghetto. All people were talking about 60 and above. And you can also see that before the Great Deportation, there were more women in the ghetto. After the Great Deportation, there are more men in the ghetto than women. And this thing really changed the Jewish street as we knew it until then. And it's also changed the life of the Jews in the ghetto. For example, Madein mentioned before, and rightly so, it's Hakatsa Nelson, the educator, the teacher, the, 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 the man who wrote so many poems and other literature works. It's Hakatsa Nelson. This picture was taken on year uh, 1938. Four years later, this picture was taken after his two young children and his wife were sent to Treblinka and he was remained in the ghetto only with his son Svi. And I'm showing you this photograph to understand that the ghetto is being shattered time after time after time, even before the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And every time things are changing, the statues, the classes, the beliefs, and time after, after time, Jews are trying to understand and to explain what is happening to them. And here I want to say a few words what is happening until mid-January, until January 1943. This is a time when the ghetto changed not only its, demogra its, its face in a demographic uh, mean, but, or meaning, but also its borders are changing. The uh, southern part of the ghetto are returned back to the Aryan side, and this is very important because from the Jewish point of view, this is what the German are doing. They're deporting Jews to Treblinka, only to Treblinka, and they're returning those streets to the Aryan side. So later on, this is what Jews will think 
that will happen to them too. What remains in the ghetto are, are about 36 Jews who have numbers, or so are not numbers on the hands, but some kind of metal numbers that Jews must wear. And those Jews are separate and in three different zones. And each one of the zone has its own character, which is very different. And trying to understand the Jewish life, this is something that you want, one must understand. Uh, the Jews who were in the shop area, most of them were working in one of the shops. The Jews who are in the bush markers, it's again, it's a very limited uh, 12 buildings that are surrounded in a wall. And this is a different shop. There is also a Teben shop, shop that we'll refer to it later on. And in the central ghetto, you have people who are working in a few shops, in a few workshops in the ghetto, but you have people who are working in the platzovkas. Those are the Jews who are leaving the ghetto, going to the Aryan side and returning every day, being body searched by the German in the borders. You also have the Vatelfassung. Those are the Jews who have to clear up the blue areas that you can see here. Those blue areas are areas that Jews should not be there at all. Anyone found there will be shot on, this pl on the place. The Jews have to take out all the things that were left in the houses. And this is, of course, a very difficult work to do, not only physically, but mainly mentally. And you have wild Jews. Again, this is not my term. This is a term in the ghetto. Those are Jews who are, don't have formally the permission to stay in the ghetto, but are still there. I won't refer too much to what is happening at this time. I'll just say that the Jews themselves described it as living on the grave of the past, as a mental exhaustion, and as a mixture of job sorrow and God's curse. But I want to show here not only the Jewish perspective, but what is happening from the German point of view. And here is something very interesting because those who are in charge of the military factories are very much unsatisfied with the great deportation. And von Ginnant writes the following, the evacuation of the Jews without any advance notice caused considerable difficulties in the growth of wartime production. Now he has no problem with the with the uh, willing with the with the Germans wanting to move the remove the Jews as quickly as possible, but he wants it to happen without inflicting any damage to the vital military production. Now, as you can see, there is some kind of a threat here, and someone who doesn't like threats is Himmler who answer, if there are those who think they can push us aside by using arguments that apparently speak of the interest of military industry, when if in fact they simply want to protect the Jews and their big business, we will know how to handle them without mercy. Now, I won't refer to it now, but if we, you want, we can refer to it later. Within this, assess there are tensions, and even when Himmler is giving a very direct orders, things will not go as he ordered. And I'll give you just one example. He gives a very clear order. He knows that they have to continue the evacuation of the Jews without interrupting production. And then on January 9, 1943, he comes to a surprise visit of the ghetto. He doesn't tell that to Kruger, who is in charge of the ghetto, but later on, he writes him the following, my dear Kruger, my little Kruger, he, 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 he obey him to immediate the closure of private firms. And he said, and he says, I consider it unconditional necessarily that the owners of those factories who have made themselves necessarily here be moved as far as possible and sent to the front. And he's mainly worried with Walter Tebens. He wants to put it under magnifying glass. And he says, if I'm not mistaken, this is a man who had become an influential industrial, perhaps even a millionaire, just because we, the Reich, gave him a Jewish, a cheap Jewish workforce. Now, this is very important because at those days, Himmler is trying to remove all the Jews who are in the Warsaw ghetto to the camps in the area Lublin, in the Lublin area. Now, the problem is that even in the SS, people understand that that is a problem because in the camps, the factories are not working as they should and people are dying and, it, and those workers cannot work as they should. So what is happening actually in Warsaw Ghetto is a little bit different. Uh, Himmler gives a very explicit order. He says that, uh, 16,000 Jews from Teben's factory should be sent to Lublin area. But what the SS is doing when they are entering the ghetto on January 1943, they are doing something else. They are entering the central ghetto and not the, the place 
where Teban shock is concentrated. And this is the first time when they are faced with armed resistance. This is a group of Hashomer Atzair, which is joining a group of Jews heading to the Umschlagplatz, heading by the German orders, of course. And those in this group of Hashomer Atzair attack the Germans. All of them, except Mordechai Nilevich, are killed. There is a group of Gordonia and Dror who sees what is happening from this apartment and decide to fight the German in a different way. They are not obeying the Germans' orders, but staying in the, in the apartment, shooting the Germans and fleeing by the roof. And there is also a group of the Bund members who are caught without any weapons because the underground is still in its very beginning and they are not they are freezing to board on the trains and being shot in the Umschlagplatz. Now, what is important for our uh, uh, interest is that many times we talked about the January uprising. And this is because we read the testimonies of those who were affiliated to the uprising groups. For example, Sylvia Lubetkin, who of course is a very important person. And she said that it was in January uprising that we fired our first shot. And this is when we understood that Germans can be killed and we can stay alive. And she says, furthermore, the uprising is what stopped the action. Now for a long time, we as researchers concentrated on their narrative. But I want to claim that this is not the only narrative and actually, it was not the main narrative. Because if you read accounts of Jews who are not part of those groups, they're telling us a different story about what happened in January. For example, the, the diary of Shmuel Winter, very much connected to Ringelblum Archive. And he writes the following. Today, that is the 22nd of January, 1943, we mark six months since the beginning of the Hurban, the destruction, the 22nd of July, 1943 to the great deportation. If we would have presented back then resistance, at least at the extent of resistance presented during the last action, the Nazis would not have so easily exterminated such a large Jewish community. If only back then Jews would have not go so easily, but hide like in the last few days, then such an action would have taken months. And I want you to see that he's talking about resistance but he's talking about a different resistance, not resistance by arms, but resistance by disobeying the Germans' orders. And actually, if you read Jewish accounts, they're not talking about January uprising or the small uprising. They're talking about January action or the second action. What they are thinking to themselves is that what happened in the past will happen now. The Germans entered the ghetto. They want to deport all the Jews to Treblinka, they didn't succeed because we were hiding. And this means that if we will be hiding, this can give us, give us some chance. Now, it is important because on January 1943, there are already rumors about Stalingrad and there are more uh, uh, air, uh, Soviet uh, airplanes that are bombing Warsaw. This means that in many different Jewish accounts, wartime accounts, people are talking about half a year. It's only a question of half a year from January 1943 and the Red Army will be here. So we must survive for an additional half a year, six months, not more. And if we'll manage to hide for six months, everything will be okay. Now, of course, everything will not be okay in the middle of year 1943, but this is what Jews are thinking to themselves. And they are thinking to themselves that the Germans will deport whoever they can to Treblinka despite the fact that the Germans are doing whatever they can to deport Jews to, to the camps in Dublin, the Warsaw Jews are still thinking that any deportation is heading to Treblinka. And they are saying, if we will hide when those streets will be returned to the Aryan side, we will survive. So if we're talking in those days between January and April, 1943, we should remember that we're talking about a different narrative of the underground and the public. Okay, and each one of them is talking about a totally different uh, reality. And if we start, if we start about, uh, with the, I'm <clears throat> sorry, with the underground, I'm sure, sure the public here knows that we have the Jeje Vu and we have the job. The Jeje Vu, which was established mainly by Beitar, but uh, was, was, uh, took into its lines many Jews from different segments of the society. And the job who had different, most of the other political groups and youth movements who are organized in the job headed by 
and I'm saying headed and I commanded by uh, uh, Anilevich because this is a very important thing. This is a group of friends. This is not any military, military unit. This is a group of friends. Now, there are many important research and maybe the most important research written about the Jejevo, not maybe the most important research written about the Jejevo is the one written by Weinbaum and Bianca, we show, which showed how different things were in the time of the war than what was presented years later. I will just hint here that today we know that even what was described about the job is not actually what happened during the war itself. But as I said, I don't want to concentrate on those fighting organizations. They were not so different in their size. It's true that there was only about 150 Beta fighters, but they uh, took into their lines many Jews from many different segments of the society. They had no ideology, uh, uh, they, they didn't base it on ideological affiliation, while to the job only members of those ideological movements and people who remained in touch to those ideological movements uh, were uh, in this uh, underground. The Jejevu had some military training, again, not a very high ranking, but they had some knowledge, which Zob didn't have. And both of them were trying to build their fighting forces, having better financial resources so they can buy weapon and try to have operational plans for fighting. I will not refer to it too much here, but if you want, we can elaborate about it later on. There was a great difference in the way that they planned their fighting. Very shortly, the job thought that it's only a question of time, Jews will be sent to Treblinka, and they planned to hide, just like Dror and Gordonia in the January uprising, so-called, and shoot the Germans from different corners of those buildings when Jews are being evacuated. Now, if you're hiding in a building, the main weapon, weapon you need is a pistol, and that was the main weapon they were trying to have. On the other hand, the Jejevu were thinking on a different strategy. They were thinking of fighting for a few days in the ghetto and then retreating to the forest and fighting with the partisans. And this is why they had more longer weapons. And this is the story of the tunnel and many other things. We can elaborate it about it later if you wish, but I want to return to the story of the public and to understand what is happening to those people. And mainly to say, that those Jews who were living in different parts of the ghetto were living in different realities. And each of them were thinking a different way about what is going to happen to them. Very generally speaking, those who had any uh, opportunity to flee to the Aryan side was trying to do that. Uh, those who had connection, those who thought we have connection, those who had money tried to flee to, to the Aryan side. Many of them returned to the ghetto. After a few weeks in the Aryan side, they found out that it's not so easy. Uh, I should say that there are people who are deciding to stay in the ghetto even in those days. And those are doctors, those are those youth movements, those are some rabbis as well. But this is one strategy that is taking place. Another one is those who are hiding in the ghetto. And another strategy, which happened mainly in the shop area, is those who were trying to find a, 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 some kind of, of certificate that they're working in those uh, German factories. And here I want to come to the uprising. During the uprising, there were about 50,000 Jews in the ghetto. And in the first days, there was a different reality in each one of those zones. Only later, after three or four years, uh, four, three or four days, of course, we can talk about joint realities. And I want to show it very, very uh, shortly. The German are entering through Nalevke and Zamenhof, as you can see here, and very soon they are finding themselves with the armed resistance of the job. Uh, this photo is important because you can see here Gensha Street and the corner of Gens this is Gensha Street and the corner of the street. And we know that the people who are in this fighting group said that after they couldn't fight the Germans, they just threw out beds and masteries and tried to shoot the Germans behind those. So this is an important photo. But we can see the Germans concentrated here in the ghetto. And later on, when the Germans are entering the, the ghetto, they are finding themselves with more fighting in other places. This is, of course, the uh, 
Platz Moronowska, which continued to have fighting not only on the second day, but even on the third day. This is where the job uh, were mainly concentrated, and this is where those flags, those very famous flags, will raise the one of the Polish one and the blue and white one. You can see that on the second day, there is also fighting in the bush uh, maker shop, as well as some shooting in the uh, area of the shop, and we'll refer to this episode later on. But let's try to understand what is happening in each one of those places. And first of all, I want to say very, very clearly that in all parts, we can see that the Jews are not obeying the German orders. When the Germans are order ordering them to go to the streets and be prepared to be evacuated, they disobey. For example, on the 19th of April, when the German entered the ghetto, that is 78 years ago, the Germans are entering with more than 1,000 soldiers to an area of, we know that there were more than 12,000 Jews there, and the German managed to catch only 380 Jews, most of them sick Jews who were in the hospitals. In the next day, on the 20th of April, when the Germans are entering the shop, uh, uh, the, the bushmaker shop, we know that there were 4,000 Jews there only 28 of them obeyed the German orders. So you can see the disobedience. But the problem of the central ghetto is the following one, as you can see in the testimony of Nyberg. The destruction of the, in the central ghetto was much more horrifying than the one in the bushmaker shop, because most of those houses had no internal metal support. The ceilings were held by wooden beams, and when the fire spread to the rooms, entire building collapsed like car building while burying all this basement. And this is very important to talk about because the disaster in the central ghetto is something that is happening from the second day, when the Germans are setting house after house on fire and those houses are collapsing. Uh, uh, this is something, this strategy is starting from the very second day of the uprising, and some of the Jews are being buried under the ruins of those houses. The situation in the shop area is completely different, and I'll give you just one example. The example is, of course, connected to the fact that those Jews are working, and Strupp is giving in order to deport those Jews only on the third day of the action, on the 21st of April. And he gives an order of an evacuation for six o'clock, and he says that Thebans, the industrial promised to leave the Jews about 4,000, 5,000 uh, of those Jews. And if you will not succeed in this voluntary evacuation, I will purify also this part of the ghetto by force. We also have a diary of one of the other industrials, and this is Schultz, who writes that this evacuation order is a result of the first resistance actions encountered by the Germans. The goal is to destroy as quickly as possible the criminalness. This is, of course, the fighting in any way that you will define it and the hiding place in the region. Now, we also have Jewish accounts. And for example, this uh, one important account is those written by Mira Pijitz, who wrote uh, heartbreaking wartime memoirs. And she and her family was in the shop area. Her mother and her sister were already in the Aryan side. And she and her father were still in the ghetto with more of 11 members of the family who stayed alive until this minute her old grandparents, some of her young uh, cousins, and they had to decide what to do. And she writes, I feel unusual weakness. I can barely stand. What should we do? Even if we think we'll be taken to a labor camp, what are our chances that this camp will not become a death camp after a few more weeks or months? And she's describing how her father, that until that point, took all the decisions and were very active, doesn't know what to do, What doesn't know what to do with his old parents, doesn't know what to do with his daughter, doesn't know what to do with his wife, which is already in the Aryan side. And she's writing later on, those who decide to go pack up their bags, the rest are already in hiding places, and we are still in a vacuum. I refuse to go. I'm so afraid I have a horrible feeling about it. And to stay? But where in the name of God? Where? What shall we do? God, what the hell? Because those good Jews in the shop not all of them had hiding places prepared. Now at the last moment, she's finding a hiding place. And so are many other Jews, because many Jews uh, um, allowed other Jews who were not planned to enter their hiding place to their hiding place. Because if somebody knows about my hiding place, I don't want him to, to stay outside of it. 
And you can see that Schultz is writing on April 21st, when the Jews were supposed to be driven out, that is at 6 a.m., it was impossible to see even one volunteer. Of course, he's just graduating. This concentration of people raises fear. However, as the days go on, more and more people show up for evacuation. Now, those are the people that you can see here. And we can follow them by those photos throughout the street of the ghetto. You can see how the house are starting to be burned. You can see how the, 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 the flames are becoming darker and darker. And we can follow this group going on. But we also know, and I won't cite here, but we know it from Mira Pijit's diary and many other places, that there is another ultimatum. The Germans are starting to, to set fire to those houses, but giving the Jews another ultimatum, another option, to come out of the hiding place. And actually, the photo that you can see here is a photo, one second, taken after the first ultimatum. You can see the, the it's much darker here. It's already so the smoke here. You can see the runes. You can see those people are guarded much better than the one before them. But after this ultimatum and after those three days, we cannot talk about different existence in the central ghetto, bushmarkers or the shops, but all of them share the same thing, which I will refer to it very, very shortly. What is happening in the hiding places, what is happening in the street, and what is happening when they are being brought to the Umschlagplatz. In the hiding places, there is a great difference between the different uh, ways of hiding in, in bunkers or in uh, apartments. I will just share with you one part of the, this amazing diary from the Ghetto Fighters House. You can see her plan, Ashego Bunker, Ulitsa Mila. Mila, this is a, a plan, the map of a bunker in Mi Mila Street. And this one is writing, this young woman is writing, the last five days were difficult in every respect since the time when 45, when people were accepted to our bunker. Most of them did not have any clothes or food. The situation got worse on Monday at midnight when the power station turned the electricity off. We are facing a difficult, difficult problem. How shall we cook? Most people have a supply of food which cannot be used without being cooked. As you remember, those people were thought they will be hiding for half a year. If you're hiding for half a year, you are using beans and other things. But you, if you cannot bake them, people are being starving in the hiding place. And those people later on find themselves trapped in those flames. I can later on refer to how people even found out that there are flames. Sometimes it could be that they saw a reflection of wind in the windows or they, they heard some noise, but many of them didn't even understand that the house is being burned before it was too late. When they go out to the street, they face destruction, abuse and mass murder. And those are things we're not talking about very many, many times when we're talking about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. This young woman is saying, I'm going out to the street. It is burning. Everything is on fire, whole streets. The entire ghetto is a sea of flames. There is no rescue. No one knows where to take shelter. Death prevails everywhere. And one important thing is to see is the account of Baruch Goldman, who says that when he leaves the, the bunker, the site is beyond all expectation. Between the walls, one can see a sea of flames, cloud of smoke bolting out of the sky. And he says that the yard was covered with their beasts. And he says even more, I have seen more than in my life destruction. He was a soldier in two world wars, but the current one exceeded all that I have seen so far. And this is how the Warsaw Ghetto looked right after the uprising. This aerial photo is from May 1943. You can see the still buildings are still standing. This is the Umschlagplatz. This is more or less Mila 18. And this is, of course, Muranowska Platz. And we can elaborate it about it later. But one of the important things I want to refer is the fact that when the Jews were taken out, there was an order of Stup to undress them and find weapons. And this is when people, mainly men, women, but also men, was searched and physically, sexually, and, uh, and of course mentally abused by the German and the Ukrainians as well. Many of these Jews, and I tried to hide uh, to protect the, the, the privacy of those women that you can see here, but you can see how the whole Jewish public is being forced to see how they must undress. And many of those people are taken to Zamenhof 19 and murdered there. So when we're talking about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, we should also talk about those th thousand abused and murdered. 
I won't refer too much to this very important picture. We can elaborate about it later on. I'll just refer that if we're talking about fighting and resistance, this is also some kind of resistance. Religious Jews who are keeping their beard and traditional clothes until 1943. We know that the Germans wrote Stroop wrote in his album Yiddish Rabiner. We know who are those Germans and we know who are those Jews. And we know that those Jews are part of Yeshivat Chachmei Lublin and Gur Hasidism, which could kept those traditional clothes for a very long time. But I'm going on because we have a few more minutes and I want to talk about what happened in the Umschlagplatz. And in the Umschlagplatz, there is, a, uh, there is again endless uh, sexual and mental uh, abuse of the Jews, as you can see from the diary of PP again from Lochmei uh, Archive, I won't refer to it. I'll just use this quotation from this anonymous Jew who is talking about people who are fading physically and mentally. But even in the Umschlagplatz, we can see the difference within the Jewish uh, public, which is concentrated there. And Paula Rothschild is telling us, there, are, there were in the Umschlagplatz families who came voluntarily from Schulzschok with small children and a lot of packages. They have brought all they had because they thought that they will need it in Travniki, in that camp in Lublin. The second group of residents in the Upschlag were of the wild ghetto Jews. Those had almost nothing. Those of Schulz said with great confidence that they were going to Travniki, to the, to the working camp. And now how dare those wild Jews to doubt it? We are not taken by force. We came here out of our own will. And Schulz promised us that we will be sent to Travniki. Even if he will not want to keep his promise, he will be forced to do so, or he will be sent to the front. They were furious at those who wanted to kill their hopes. Those Jews from the Umschlagplatz, with permits of the German factories and without them, are being sent to different places, some of them to Pronatova, to Travniki, some of them to Treblinka and Majdanek. But all of those Jews in Lublin area will be killed on November 1943, if not sent before to other camps, the Nazi camps. And I want to, I'm coming here almost to the end, I want to show you two more photos, or one more photo, an aerial photo, this is an aerial photo, taken on July 44 by the Germans, and I want you to see this car that you can see here. This car that you can see here, many of you, may, maybe you will remember that this is a Tebens factory that, what, what, that was in the ghetto prior to the Great, great Deportation. Tzivi Lubetkin tells, tells us that they didn't have any grasp at the Tobin shop in Posta Street. And still we know that Stroop says that on May 12th, there was a blockade in the street and a concrete house was put on fire. Jews were removed and it was blown to prevent it from being used by thugs. When Stroop is talking about thugs, he's talking about fighters. And here I really want to end. Because if we're looking about on those Jews, and here you can see a list of documents sent by the JKN to the Polish government Excel on May 1944, again from the ghetto fighters house, you can see that Hirsch Wasser wrote about soldiers with no weapon. And he said, among thousands of men and women, old and young, the desire of resistance was born, which eliminated the natural anxiety, the fear of death and anguish. The masses realized that by failing to surrender, they were fighting the enemy in a special way, making it difficult to destroy and annihilate. And similar things can be said in can be were said by Stroop. And he said, it doesn't matter how many soldiers did the Jewish fighting organization have. The essence of the problem from his point of view is that they had an influence on all the Jewish society in a chain reaction. They themselves, he said, didn't know what fire did they light in the minds of thousand Jews or passive so far. So what I want to say is that talking about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, we have to remember not only the job, not only the Jejevu, but also the civilians. And I will end uh, at least my presentation here by citing a very important phrase by Rashi. I'm not sure my translation to English is good enough. He said in Hebrew, koach koach azroa, gvurai gvurai talev. Rashi was a very well-known commentator, uh, Jewish, rabbinical figure in the Middle Ages who said, power is brought for us, force, heroism is the bravery of the heart. And I think that 78 years after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, we should talk about the bravery of the heart of those masses and not only about the fighting organizations. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, uh, Javi. Uh, I can, I'm going through the chat box and I see some of the reactions. Um, uh, there are a few questions, so we'll get to those as well. And I think the way that you uh, concluded, really, if you think about the percentage, the 98%, and I recommend, really, those of you who speak Hebrew definitely can read the book in Hebrew. Not very easy to read, but uh, I think it's a very important uh, book. Do we, and people are asking when it's coming out in English. Do you have a date or? When I'll finish working on it, it's my fault. It okay. It was already it's translated by Ed Vashem, but I don't have a date yet and it's only my fault. Okay. You know, we can blame Corona because <laughs> yes. of COVID, so that's fine. That's always uh, true. Some questions that we have, uh, and I have to say that there was one remark that was very interesting. You're talking about the 98%, and someone said that it's very important to be aware of uh, that, that uh, the large group of people, but he called them the Jewish bystanders. And I think that that's not exactly the point that you were trying to make, and I think we understand that from the last thing that you said. Uh, they weren't bystanders, they were resistors, but uh, in a different way. So I think it's a very uh, important point, and I'm so glad that uh, we brought that up. Um, someone asked about the artist that you uh, use from his wedding, wanted to know the name of the artist. Peretz so, Khushati, that's the ar artist, Peretz Khushati. He okay. has an incredible life story. Uh, he and his uh, wife from the ghetto lost track during the Holocaust. Each of, one of them later on married other people. And only years later on, they met again through phone. They were too old to fly to each other. But those who are interested, there is a, his a drawings are kept at Yad Vashem. And there is a publication of it, Peretz Khurushati. That is a name. And oh. I will also say about bystanders, I'll just say that you said right, Medin. Uh, first of all, today in Holocaust studies, we don't use the term bystanders even for other things. We know that uh, when you see such brutality, you cannot really be a bystander. But as you said, Medin, what I wanted to stress is that those 98% were proud part of the uprising and took an active part in it by disobeying the German orders. Exactly. Um, some uh, Another question, actually, someone was asking, uh, at first someone said about their mother and then someone said about their father who didn't talk about his experiences. Asking, is there a list of the workers in the in the shops and the factories of the of the Jews that were uh, sent to work for forced labor? There, there isn't a couple, complete list. There mm. are some partial like, uh, list, but no, there is. Th this is a great problem. You, you, you. Maybe some of you know that our colleagues from Poland did an enormous work trying to trace the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto, and despite their great effort we have the names of only about 100,000 Jews. This is, I think, mm -hmm. the last number that uh, Professor Barbara Engel King told me, although we know that more than a half a million Jews passed through the Warsaw Ghetto, and we don't have complete list of the Jews in the shop, no. Um, of course, uh, an another question, and it didn't come up in your uh, talk, asking about uh, the Poles that were living around the ghetto, if they were were Poles that were helpful and able to help uh, the Jews that were inside the ghetto. So. Okay, so, so first of all, the question of righteous among the nations is a very important one. And we know that they were, uh, of course, the righteous among the nation in Warsaw. And actually there were Jews outside of Warsaw who fled to Warsaw thinking that they can hide in this big city, as well mm -hmm. as many Poles who were not uh, helpful to the Jews, but actually took part in their persecution. I will say that part of the very important testimonies that we have for the German brutality comes from the Polish uh, neighbors who watch terrified at those uh, children being shot at the roof, uh, people trying to jump and endless atrocities. And those testimonies are very important as well because they are part of what happened in the uprising. Yes, definitely. Very interesting question, uh, you know, uh, Tamara Novogodok. She's asking if uh, uh, the public, if uh, you can talk a little bit about the, the public, and I don't know about this, it'll be interesting, the publication in the ghetto calling to follow the Jews of Novogodok uh, who successfully fought off the Nazis. So, yes, so 
<laughs> First of all, Tamar, it's good to, to see you here. And of course, Novogrudek is a very important story, the story of the talent and so on. And it was described in a very weird way. As you said, Tamara in the underground uh, newspapers in the ghetto. But the problem is that what was described doesn't fit what happened really in Novogrudek. But this is important because Jews in the Warsaw ghetto who are part of those different political and youth movement, which will later on become an, upper, an underground, try to find uh, examples of Jews who are fighting. This is true regarding the rabbi from Rajin, uh, Rabbi mm -hmm. Leiner, who was, again, stories about his action as well, the very well-known poem of Katzenelson. So the story was not as it was described, but you are right, Tamara, that for some it still was an aspiration because they didn't know exactly what happened. And the fact, the fact, at least what they thought is a fact that Jews managed to fight the Germans, to flee and so on was very important. And I will also uh, thank Tamara that because actually this reminds us that although it's very important to talk about the Warsaw uprising, uh, upri uh, uh, ghetto uprising, and Eagle mentioned it, and Umedin mentioned it, it was not the only armed resistance. And there were many other resistance, many different kinds of Amida, and all of them have some kind of connection to each other. What is unique in the Warsaw Ghetto, and Eagle mentioned it, is the fact that it was a, some kind of a popular res, a, a uprising with so many Jews taking part. You had the Jews who were hiding, you had the Jews who were fighting, and both of them shaped the uprising as it was. But there were many other accounts, and those of you who don't know, don't know about Novogrudek and haven't heard about the wonderful museum established and, 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 and done by, by the work, the wonderful work by Tamara, please look to it because it's very, very important. Of course, you can always go to the Ghetto Fighters House YouTube channel and look at the amazing program that we did with Tamara and some of the family members who's a, oh. uh, yeah, who's a parent who are part of the, uh, the escape. Uh, incredible. Um, actually, someone is asking if you, if the resistors knew about the efforts of Arthur Zingelboin, uh, who was smuggled out to London, uh, was traveling all over trying to get people to uh, understand what was happening, and, and leaving his wife and child behind in the in the ghetto. Um, okay, the story of Arthur Zingelboin is really a heartbreaking story. Again, like many other, he was one of the leaders of the Bund. And he fled in 1940. As other, he even was the one of the members of the first Judenrat in the Warsaw Ghetto. But as somebody who was a leader of the Bund movement, he was afraid that the Germans will, will be looking after him. And he fled and he managed to get to uh, London during the war, where he served as one of the two Jewish uh, representative, Jewish representative in the Polish government exile. And he's trying to do whatever he can. He's a man that maybe some of you know that Karski met after mm -hmm. leaving Europe, trying, and he's telling Karski what uh, Karski is telling him what uh, Feiner told him and what other Jews in the ghetto told him. And he doesn't can't, can't find himself within this very difficult situation. And when he hears on May 1943 about the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, he commits suicide leaving famous leaders to the president of the Polish Republic as well as the, the Tushikovsky as well as to the president of the United States saying maybe I will manage to do more with my death what I couldn't do with my life. I cannot stay quiet when, when so many Jews are being buried alive and you are right uh, that he also left a private letter and in this letter, which was left to his wife and child, Artek, he wrote, he wrote his friends and he said, if any one of you will meet after the war, my wife, Mania, or my son, Artek, tell them that I never forget, forgave myself for leaving them in Warsaw. Uh, Mania and Artek were killed during the uprising. There was some kind of an effort to, to hide him in the Aryan side, but his mother didn't want to leave him other children of Ziegelboom who left the, the Europe, occupied Europe before uh, um, uh, survived, of course. Uh, but of course, this is a very important story that shows us that the echoes of the uprising were much more uh, apparent than many times we think. I haven't found any account from the ghetto itself referring to the suicide. On mm -hmm. the Aryan side, the Jeke and others refer to it, but later on. It happened on the 12th of May, 
and during this time, the Warsaw Ghetto was already uprising was towards its end. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I, of course, I don't, <laughs> I didn't know the story myself. So now I have, I'm going to look for the letter because I understand, like you said, it's in the museum in Washington. The letter is, is you can find it in Arthur Stein's book, which is about to be published very soon. Once again, in, in Hebrew, Achaver Artu. So okay. hopefully. So for our uh, <laughs> Hebrew speaking Hebrew audience, yeah. there you go. Um, I think uh, one more question. Uh, the, uh, it goes back to the citation that you brought from Sivia Lubenkin. And uh, the question is, um, uh, does the citation of Sivia uh, Lubenkin uh, uh, of the uprising in January, that it was going to stop the Aksia, represent what really happened on January 18th and 22nd? I think you discussed that. Only 5,000 Jews collected in Central Berlinka. Did the Germans plan to evacuate the entire ghetto on that day? Okay, so yeah. you're thank you for this question. I'm sorry for not doing, oh, I cannot share my, my, my presentation again. I wanted to show you this expert. If I could share it, I can show it again. Um, so this is what uh, the fighters thought, the underground thought. They thought that the Germans wanted to evacuate all the Jews to Treblinka, and because of our resistance, they didn't succeed. Other Jews in the ghetto, and I gave you just one expert from Winter, but you can find it in other wartime accounts, thought that the Germans wanted to send all the Jews to Treblinka and did not succeed because we were hiding. Actually, the Germans, the order that Himmler gave at this point was to send 16,000 Jews from Teben's factory to the working, to the concentration camps in Lublin area. But the SS personnel who are in Warsaw ghetto and are uh, uh, responsible for what is happening there, understand that sending those workers to the Lublin camp, camps will put them in a difficult situation. And they prefer to look to those, those, for those wild Jews in the central right. ghetto and not go to the area of the shops. So what actually stopped was not the hiding and not the uprising, and the Jews were not sent to Treblinka at this point, but to Lublin. But the Germans saw that this doesn't work and they will have to work in a different way. This is a time, I didn't mention it before, but Himmler gives a chance to uh, uh, Walter Tebens and to other industrials, he gives them some kind of a chance to send the Jews in an organized way to the Lublin camps. And there are even delegation trying to convince them to send to be sent to those camps. And one of the heartbreaking experts from Mira Pijit's diary is that she describes one of those meetings that comes this assessment from the camp Lublin, from Lublin camps and is trying to convince them to move in themselves voluntarily to the camps in Lublin. And one of the women is, is, is yelling, uh, return me, give me back my child. Give me back my child and then I'll go to wherever you want. If you don't give me back my child, Nothing, nothing is true. And, and so from the Jewish point of view, all deportations are to Treblinka, even though in the reality, they were sent to other places. So thank you for that question. Right. Um, I think we'll finish with uh, one more statement. Uh, Pinchas Guter is with us. He um, participates in many of our programs. Thank you, Pinchas. And he wrote, I was in a bunker till the third week of the uprising in the first week it may, in May. We were discovered, and when we can, came out, I was very proud that they were scared of us. Pinchas. So I think that kind of uh, sums up what you were saying about the uh, ninety-eight percent. And Pinchas, of course, was a, a young man, a young boy. So it expresses exactly what you were talking about about this uh, resistance, uh, not the, the the uprising, but the resistance that was around. Um, I want to thank you again. Uh, Professor Dreyfus, Javi, uh, for uh, being with us today, uh, especially on, on this day. Uh, that's how we thought about it. Um, when we thought about April 18th and April 19th, you're the person that we wanted to be with us today. And thank you so much uh, for sharing your knowledge and your insights. And thank you to our audience for these questions. And there's so many more questions. Uh, and thank you again for, for joining us, and I hope you'll join us for the next program. Um, and of course, um, I want to say uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon.
to everyone as we slowly say goodbye to everyone. So it's Laila Tov from here. And Toda Tachavi. Thank you all. And thank you, Ghetto Fighters House, for everything.